it's Searching for Answers. And we're glad that you're searching right along with us here as we work our way through the Word of God, asking ourselves always, what did it mean when it was written? And what does it mean in our lives today? We're bringing those questions to bear on Paul's letter to Timothy, who is a young colleague, been assigned to a major city and to the pastoral work of that great congregation there. Yeah. Lots of issues, lots of challenges. So get your Bible and find the first epistle to Timothy around the middle of the, of the New Testament. And we'll jump right in here with Dr. Bernard Taylor, Old Testament specialist, um, uh, research professor in religious studies here at Loma Linda University, and Dr. Leo Ranselin, New Testament scholar, uh, associate dean of the School of Religion at Loma Linda University. My name is John Jones in the Divinity School at La Sierra, and we are glad you are with us. We're right into chapter two. We, we see that verse 8, right down through verse 15 as basically one paragraph. So we're going to, we may break it up into pieces a little as we go, but let's start with, with uh, verse um, 8 and, and work our way down through it again. Dr. Bernard, take us into it and see where we go. All right. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 8 and onwards. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument, also, that the women should dress themselves modestly and decently in suitable clothing, not with their hair braided or with gold, pearls or expensive clothes, but with good works, as is proper for women who profess reverence for God. Mm. Let a woman learn it in uh, silence with full submission. I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She is to keep silent. And through there, woman can also be translated in wife, wife. and man can mm -hmm. be translated as husband. And as mm -hmm. we continue. Yeah. For Adam was not deceived, but the woman was, was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing, provided they continue in faith and love and holiness with modesty. How do you feel about that, friends? <laughs> <laughs> we look a little bit at this at the close of our last conversation, but there's more to work on, isn't there? So stay with us, and we'll begin to pick up the pieces a little bit. Anything yeah. you want? To um, one of the things, well, first off, First Timothy has a companion, Second Timothy, and then Titus, and these are often known as the pastoral epistles. Mm -hmm. These are pastoral in tone. They're not primarily theology, though that is not uh, irrelevant. And we have answers. We don't have questions. Mm. <laughs> and so, mm. for instance, uh, I desire that men should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. Why would he say that? Mm. Unless perhaps there is tension and uh, anger that has arisen in the past. And, and don't let prayer become a vehicle for this unholy practice. Mm -hmm. And the women should dress themselves modestly and decently in suitable clothing, on the one hand, not with their hair braided or with gold and pearls, expensive clothes, on the other hand, but with good works as is proper for women who profess reverence for God. So here we have a situation where there are those, obviously it must be being done. And when we think about who would do it, you have on the one hand those who have come from wealth and are accustomed to dressing in this fashion. Yeah. And on the other hand, those who have no access to it and would never be able to do it, and in the process are being shown up so that going to church is an embarrassing situation because you always uh, come up short. Mm -hmm. So, there's a start. Yeah, that's a good start. <laughs> Leo, what do you think? So I think, as I said at the previous uh, 
session that it's important that we apply appropriate uh, interpretive guidelines to this text. And for me, I, here's how I think we, we need to begin. First of all, and this passage needs to be interpreted within the larger context of the New Testament, within the larger context of the 13 letters of Paul. And when I look at those 13 letters, I see that in Romans 16, women played uh, an influential role in Paul's apostolic team. When I look at Philippi, uh, I see that in Philippians, Paul alluded to two women that were leaders of that Philippian church. When I look at Corinth, especially 1 Corinthians 11, uh, it's a tough text, but what comes through clearly is that women prayed, excuse me, and prophesied during the worship service. And I think when you prophesy, there's an element of instruction and teaching that takes place within the community of believers. In fact, that's what prophesy really means. It's not merely foretelling the future. It's actually speaking forth, forth-telling on behalf of God's exactly. people, isn't it? So when you look at those larger texts, you see that women played a leading role in churches, yes. and they taught uh, mm -hmm. in churches. And so when you come to this text, please be aware of those realities, and you can't, as I said previously, universalize these tech, this text to say this is for all time that Paul wants to restrict the role of women in the life of the church. The other piece that I think is important to add is that Ephesus had the cult of Artemis. And at the cult of Artemis, women played a very, very influential role in that, uh, in that cult, in that religion. And it's quite possible that women uh, converted out of Artemis mm -hmm. and may well now have come into the church at Ephesus mm -hmm. and wanting to exercise perhaps uh, mm -hmm. that same kind of influential role mm -hmm. at Ephesus. And the church was, I think, being destabilized potentially by, by that kind of uh, a sentiment and experience that they had previously. And then the other aspect that I think we need to consider is that without question, there is some false teaching taking place here uh, with some false teachers. And it's possible that some of these perhaps wealthier women uh, had fallen prey to the influence of these false teachers and were exercising inordinate amount of authority and influence within the church. And I think for Paul, when you have, I think, both men or women destabilizing the church, uh, he gets a bit huffy about it, mm -hmm. and it's problematic for him yeah. because for him, order and stability and harmony in the church is crucial. As a matter of fact, right at the end of 1 Corinthians 14, after he deals with mm -hmm, the issue of mm -hmm, speaking mm -hmm. um, yeah. in tongues and prophecies, he does say right at the end, all things should be done decently and in order. Yes, crucial for Paul. And so this is not taking place during the worship service. And in light of all that, I think he has some draconian measures that he takes here to bring about order, decency, stability, and harmony. Yes. That's how I read this text. Specific problem at Ephesus, please do not universalize this for all time. Yeah, exactly so. Indeed, these verses, 8 through 15, um, flow right out of his burden in the first half of chapter 2 mm. for public respect, decency, right. dignity, uh, honor, honorable uh, conduct and behavior. This is now simply bringing it home mm. to the, the particular lifestyle of the Christians as Christians. Right. Um, and so I think... Uh, it's of a piece with the larger overarching principles he's laid down yeah. in the first half of chapter 2. But it's clear that he has a particular kind of mission, a kind of vision in mind, right, for, for what a Christian ought to look like and sound like mm. and behave like, men and women. Yeah. And, and what he does say is closed with the culture of his time. Yeah, times. it really is. Yeah. And we must not yeah. forget that either. This He's is a, a creature of his time. Yeah, it is. It's a sharply divided world mm. in which generally men and women had, had very little to do with each other, particularly in public. Mm -hmm. um, but there was, uh, behind the scenes, a certain amount of immorality, oftentimes cloaked in the robes of religious experience, mm -hmm. interestingly enough. So there's already uh, a framework of superstition, uh, I mean, of suspicion, I should say, rather. Um, people wondering about these different funny cults and sects mm -hmm. that are um, 
Roman writers complain that in this time of the Roman Empire that, that all kinds of strange religions are popping up around the Mediterranean world and they don't like it. And mm -hmm. Christianity is very susceptible to just looking like one more of these strange kind of right. things. And Paul really wants to make the case, no, that's not us. It is interesting that men should pray Lifting up holy hands, you know, <laughs> not against yeah. each other, <laughs> which is probably part yeah. of the turn of phrase here. Right. When, you, when you visit the catacombs underneath the city of Rome, there are small chapels carved out in the soft limestone there that were places of worship for not only Christians, but other groups as well. But, but certain ones are identified as Christian. You can, you can see that by the markings uh, on the plaster wall. And these frescoes, these, these paintings that are on the wall, work, the colors worked into the fresh plaster while it's still damp, are scenes of early Christian worship from the first and early second century. You can see how they prayed. Men are portrayed standing with their hands up praying to God in this position. We think they got that out of Judaism. We think that that was a practice in the synagogues at that time as well. But uh, it's clear that Paul wants to uh, sanctify the Christian experience. Say, if you raise your hands, let it not be against each other, mm -hmm. but toward God in submission and supplication. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yeah. Why did the Christian church have such a difficult time with heterodoxy, with, with false teaching? Mm -hmm. um, on the one hand, they must have seen a value in it because, you know, you don't have counterfeit brown paper. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not worth anything. Right. right. The, mm -hmm. the desire to cheaply gain access to something is an indication that it's a, a thing of value mm -hmm. that they can mm -hmm. monetize mm -hmm. or, or mm -hmm. something like mm -hmm. that. And, uh, but, but there is this, this battle, this struggle for it to survive. Yeah. Uh, the, the Didache, the, the, which means teaching, the early Christian document was struggling with this same sort of world too. Yeah. It's fascinating. It is. It's much more richly textured than, than most of us realize. There's such a tendency, you know, to, to say, well, back in the early church, uh, as if that were a, mm. a one unitary thing, the fact of the matter is that scholars increasingly say we cannot speak of the early Christian church, only of the early Christian churches. Mm. There is so much difference among them, even within the first century, mm -hmm. when our New Testament was being written, we can find traces of very different understandings of God, quite diverse understandings of Jesus, who he was and what he accomplished, and of what the Christian life should look like. Indeed, we have that very issue at work here in Paul's letter to Timothy, because there apparently was one current of early Christianity that maybe Timothy is a little attracted to, of a sort of a, a spiritual life that's made up of asceticism, mm -hmm. uh, severe practices, putting down the body. We'll get to that in more detail in a later conversation. But here is one stream mm -hmm. of se among several within early Christianity. So you're right. There were there were currents that were pushing and pulling, and and which later on actually split out in different directions, and then you have, finally, the attempt in the early churches uh, to define heresy. Mm -hmm. It's not quite heresy in the New right. Testament, mm -hmm. but it's the precursors of some heretical movements yeah. that had to be trimmed back um, a couple hundred years down the road here. What do you think? I, I think you're absolutely right, and as I've read through these six chapters trying to ascertain the nature of the false teaching, yeah. you just get bits and pieces yeah. here, mm -hmm. myths and endless genealogies, they forbid marriage and abstinence of certain foods, uh, they're wrapped up with profane myths and old wives' tales, and then at the end of chapter six, I think it's an important verse there, 
He says, uh, verse 20, avoid profane chatter and yeah. contradictions of what is falsely called gnosis, knowledge. Yeah. So maybe incipient Gnosticism perhaps uh, yeah. percolating in this church, uh, an yeah. esoteric religious uh -huh. group mm -hmm. that's got yeah. this strange right. understanding of things, as you said, asceticism perhaps. And it looks like uh, Paul calls out two people, Hymenaeus and Alexander. Looks like they've been excommunicated um, yeah. in the church. Yeah. And maybe there's still some within. Yeah. As I read through the six chapters, I, I, I gain a sense, wow, Paul's really, I think, concerned about this influence and this group of people within the church. Yes. And that's why he says, hey, I urge you <clears throat> to tell these people not to teach different doctrine. Yeah. Uh, right that, at the beginning. Yeah, right. Chapter 1, verse 3. Yep. You don't get funny with the doctrines. Yep. Yeah. So. And, and don't, don't be so preoccupied, verse 4, with these genealogies yeah. and this and that. We, frankly, we don't know what that was all about. Right. We're not sure. It, there are hints that it may even have hooked into some ideas of, of humans and angels right. somehow uh, procreating or whatever. We, we just don't know. But apparently it was enough to be a, a real distraction mm -hmm. and, uh, and to lead some people astray. Yeah. And so when you piece all that together, is it possible that in chapter 2, these women who are uh -huh. being instructed uh, yeah. are causing some difficulty have been co-opted by these false teachers. Well, yeah, that. we we read the warning against what he calls old wives tales, <laughs> so to speak. So, yeah, you know, I think I think all of this Leo underscores your point. This may be a particular situation in Ephesus. I think it is. Where the female side of the congregation needs some particular encouragement and and reproof, mm. frankly. But even to generalize that, across the early church within the first century is already a problem, mm -hmm. much greater to pull it out and try to generalize it for our lives today. Yeah. Um, we, we, we need that warning, and I think it's important. Then how are we to say, let a woman learn, let a wife yeah. learn in silence with full submission, I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority, keep silence, mm. and yet, Leo, you have already alerted us to that strange um, surprise we encounter in Romans chapter 16, yeah. where Paul is saying hello to everybody in Rome right. and, and sends his greetings there in verse 7, hello to Andronicus and Junia, perhaps right. husband and wife, yep. they're his relatives. They, they belong to his um, extended family in some way. And Andronicus, a Latin name, is male, masculine ending. Junia is a feminine ending. Yep. The early copyists of these ancient manuscripts were so scandalized by the idea that Junia could be numbered among the apostles. As Dominance. she, yeah. As she is, in yeah. verse 7, among the apostles. Right. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And that they change the ending. This cannot be Junia. This has got to be Junius. It's got to be a man. And they give, they change the text. Mm -hmm. Those scribes in those monasteries, <laughs> in, those, uh, in those European monasteries, just couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. And they changed it to a masculine ending because these are apostles. A woman cannot possibly be an apostle, but here's Paul saying, say hi to Junia. Yep. She's among the apostles, a leading, a leading church leader. Uh, yeah, we, when we read this about keeping silent, we have to acknowledge the larger canonical context, as you've reminded us. Go down the road a little further for the um, audience and uh, explain how you know that it was changed. Ah, simply, the earliest manuscripts all have the feminine ending. Yes. Mm -hmm. The later manuscripts have the masculine. Ah. And in the process of going from copy to copy mm -hmm. to copy, mm -hmm. yeah, it mm -hmm. just, it got caught on and everyone followed it. Yep. Yeah, 
I think that will be helpful for them. Yeah. It's just too much for us to think of a woman as an apostle. Yes. <laughs> yes. So here we are. Now, the thing about Adam and Eve, then, Adam formed first, and then Eve. We think the rabbis used to make a point out of that mm -hmm. as well. But uh, <clears throat> what are we to make of this? I mean, what is, what is the, what's the line of argument here in, in 1 Timothy 2? What shall we say? Let's well, this moral let's exhortation. Let, let, let's also confess this is a difficult text. Yeah. Because this moral exhortation that he does give is grounded theologically in this creation uh, account, right? As you know, verses 13 and 14. Now, for the rabbis, uh, the original situation always took precedence. Uh, hmm. You go back to the beginning, and that yes. trumps everything else. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, and here is a trip back to the beginning, and there is an order. Uh, Adam first, and then Eve. Um, but then it says that Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived. And by our standards, if, you're, if you are deceived, then you're off the hook. At least, you know, you, you are not as culpable as somebody who goes in with both eyes open yeah. and does it anyway. Yeah. Even if we are to suggest that it was out of love for Eve and fear that she would be without a husband, that he did it. Uh, or that he would be without a wife. <laughs> <laughs> and that too, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, even so, even so, even... Now, we don't know. The, the Greek allows for several different nuances in verse 15 about the relationship between being saved and giving birth. Mm. It can mean, in a way, despite, I'm probably overstating it a bit, but even though she is giving childbirth, she will be saved, or that childbirth is a pathway toward her salvation. Yeah. We... We're not quite sure of the Greek syntax there and how best to um, render that over into uh, our English today. But nonetheless, the main point stands. It's a matter of faith and love and holiness. Yeah, with modesty, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, <coughs> sophrosunes, humility or, or <coughs> modesty. What do you think? For me, I think another point that is important to underscore with respect to Paul, oftentimes when Paul faces challenges in his church, he gets exercised about. He gets, and <laughs> you could say almost goes over the top. <laughs> Let me give you for example there at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 4, as he's trying to address, yeah. lay the groundwork for from some specific issues from chapter 5 and, and following, he does say, what, what would you have me come here, with a stick or with a spirit of love or gentleness? Mm -hmm. That's a bit over the top. Yes. And then in Galatians, he says, I wish they would go the whole way and, yeah. and um, <laughs> take the knife. Yeah. And then in 1 Corinthians 10 through 13, he's got to deal with the issue of super apostles there at Corinth. And he is almost beside himself yes. as he addresses right. that challenge that he has there at Corinth. And so I think when he really goes after a problem, he goes... <laughs> with full vigor, right. and maybe here with yeah. the issue of worship yeah. being compromised, mm -hmm. he grounds that theologically with this text here uh, mm -hmm. of Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. So I, I think uh, that's kind of how I read that in, in childbearing. <laughs> For me, it's a bit over the top, Paul, but uh, I take your point. We need to have order and stability and harmony within worship services. I will agree to you uh, with you at least to a certain extent. We do not have Paul... I think here, sort of sitting back right. with his cup of tea, and um, today we would say with his pipe. No, we wouldn't. <laughs> but right. you know, with, with his manuscripts and kind of working it yeah. through and crossing out and thinking right. it through. You know, I don't think so. We know, we know that Paul, maybe not always, but regularly, had somebody taking dictation, mm -hmm. writing as fast as possible. Right. Indeed, at Romans. Uh, Paul is saying hello to everyone, and uh, um, and uh, the uh, Tertius, his his scribes, scribbles in quickly. Oh, uh, between between name, I Tertius send you my greetings also. Right. We we see 
Paul the rhetorician. Mm -hmm. We see Paul the shepherd. He's, yep. a, he's a pastor for sure. But we see Paul, a Paul, even in a letter to Timothy, who is a, a Paul who speaks in public. He's a rhetorician. He speaks yeah, in public. Right. And we see him pacing back and mm -hmm. forth, shaking his fist, you know, in the air, kind of laying it on them. Right. And he is exercised about some problems right. there in Ephesus, and for good reason. Yes. They've got problems. And Paul is deeply concerned about that. Yes. So here he has to tackle, starting with, with, verse, with chapter 3 uh, and following, he will have some specific advice to Timothy. But right here, he's got advice to the whole congregation. And he's really preaching at them rather than Timothy. Yeah. And Timothy, here's what I want you to tell them. In a way, he's speaking yeah. through Timothy. Another example of that in 1 Corinthians 1, Paul says, look, I didn't baptize anybody except yeah, Crispus right. and yeah, Gaius. Right, and then he right, says, oh, right. wait a minute, perhaps another person. Yeah. So sometimes yeah. he's quite engaged in the matter at hand. Uh, there is a, there's an orality, a verbal quality to these texts that he's, um, yeah. and someone's trying to get it down as fast as they can. Yeah. I'm still back with Adam and Eve yes. <laughs> and the childbearing. Yeah. And it, it occurs to me mm. that this is actually accounting for, which is a substitute for exegeting, <laughs> the story back then. Mm -hmm. Eve was deceived, Adam wasn't, and in the next chapter, Eve, it says that in sorrow she will bring forth, and I think that uh, the text is understanding that she was forgiven and she was given a task. It's not that every woman has to bear children to be saved. Mm. That has nothing to, get, uh, to do with it, and... Um, I do this, I hope, faithfully following your call for a study of the context mm -hmm. and, and the background and where it came from. And um, so that's, I think, what, what I see as at play here. Mm. You know, later on, we're going to bump into a stream or current within this congregation who were opposed to marriage. Mm -hmm. And it may be that right here, we have an acceptance of marriage mm -hmm. and of childbirth, yeah, which true. is part of mm. the appropriate yeah. way. Yeah. Um, it at the same time entails love and holiness and modesty. Mm -hmm. yeah? Yeah. So these are positives, um, but it, it may already be a foreshadowing of what Paul is about to say soon mm -hmm. on the uh, larger issues of sexuality in one's life as well. Yeah. These are richly embroidered passages. The thoughts flow quickly upon one another as Paul writes. They complicate the picture through associations that don't necessarily suggest themselves to us. But I think they were part of the standard way of thinking in those days, which we need to take in consideration as we continue searching for answers.